This lack of belief in the music industry affected Dylan's subsequent live shows. Having rediscovered a passion for touring during his seminal shows with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers back in the mid-80s, his enthusiasm had followed through to the ambitious and gruelling never-ending tour. Yet the gigs that followed the release of Under the Red Sky in 1991 were lacklustre, with many observing that the band were under-rehearsed and Dylan himself uninterested. He regained a spark, certainly, with, uh, with the Petty Tours, uh, and, and that followed on uh, when he made the change, or was forced to make the change, into the never-ending tour. And he had a great guy in G. Smith, his band leader, and the 1988, the beginning of the, uh, the never-ending tour, for the first couple of years, it was, uh, it, was, it was good stuff. But a big down seemed to occur with the departure of G. Smith. Um, I mean, Dylan didn't seem to know quite where he was going or what he was doing at that time. He didn't even replace G. Smith on guitar. Um, he actually virtually auditioned on stage. He tried out guitarist after guitarist during the live performances. Uh, yeah, it's a most strange way to audition people in front of a paying audience. His live performances deteriorated very badly after Red Sky came out and failed. Um, and uh, in 91, he, 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 he was in the absolute pits of despair uh, and certainly the absolute low point musically. I mean, the shows were diabolical, the early shows in 91. I mean, it's unspeakable. Dylan looked smashed out of his brain most of the time. The band were hopeless and it didn't look good. This apparent lethargy became all too noticeable in February 1991, when Dylan received the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammys. What should have been celebratory ended up an embarrassment for both Dylan and the audience. Bob Dylan. I think the nadir of Dylan's public career came with his Grammy appearance in 1991. You know, he played Masters of War, which seemingly was a, some sort of protest against, you know, the, the first Iraq war. Nobody could tell what song he was playing. You know, and here is the great voice of a generation, you know, one of the great American poets gets up to speak. No one can really figure out what he's trying to say. And that was it. I think people just kind of fled from Dylan in droves at that point. And there was an element of, this guy's had it. There's two ways of looking at that extraordinary performance of Masters of War at the Grammys in 1991. One is the obvious, which is that it is dreadful. You know, he, he is an infuriating performer. When you, when you see him when he's good, he is just still astonishing. When you see him when he's bad, it's a very, very long evening. And that performance of Masters of War illustrates why it can be bad. I mean, it's... it's, it's self-indulgent, it's utterly contemptuous of the audience and indeed of his own band and it is one of those ones and this happens on a bad night when he's playing live. He'll start off on a song and you can start to see his backing band looking at each other just going, you know, they can't tell what it is he thinks he's playing. So at that level, yeah, it's absolutely woeful. In context, however, um, it's very hard not to think that it's actually kind of a cool thing to do, to actually go before that audience of, you know, idiots in suits at that kind of ludicrous carnival of corporate mediocrity that is the Grammys and just dump five minutes of absolutely atonal, <laughs> excruciating din on them. Um, if that was what he was thinking, then I think it's kind of up there with, with Bill Drummond pretending to machine gun the crowd at the Brits. It's, it's... If you kind of choose to look at it as a kind of great iconoclastic gesture, it's, it's, it's actually pretty rocking.
Whatever Dylan's intention, the performance only furthered the growing opinion that once again the singer-songwriter had truly lost his way and that this time it could possibly be permanent. Finally, you just can't confound your audience. You can't insult your audience. And I think that's what that Grammy performance represented. People just kind of thought, you know, this is a joke. You know, why am I supposed to take this seriously? And I also think Dylan understood that. You know, he would never in a thousand years admit it, but I think he understood how bad things had gotten. At that stage of things, you know, it's sort of like that moment when you, you turn around and there's nobody standing behind you. I think that's where Dylan was right then. Not merely had he changed his band mem membership, which was causing some problems on stage, but also, um, even in interviews, he was, he was beginning to question the very nature of what he was doing. And, um, you know, it's almost he'd reached this existential angst about songwriting in general. Um, he's famously saying, look, what's the point? What's the point of songwriting? I've already written enough songs. There are two, and he said, you know, key, there are too many songs out there already. I think once you start questioning the process of songwriting and you start questioning what it all means anyway in the greater scheme of things, I mean that inevitably will, need, will lead to inertia and it will lead to writer's block because you're, you, you know, you're, 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 it's, it's like just as depression, you can't get up in the morning, you, you just want to, you know, what's the point? Um, the same thing seemed to happen I think with Dylan around that time and therefore he he just wasn't motivated to write songs, I think, and um, and you know that's one of the reasons why we didn't get another album for you know the best part of five to seven years or whatever.